Scripture reading this morning will be read from John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. If you're reading from a pew Bible, you can find that on page 1,242. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this the, my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and, and abide in his love, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. You may be seated. It's a beautiful day and we are thankful for everyone that is able to be here and worship with us today and especially if you are a guest and you have come today, we are thankful that you're here. I know we have folks visiting with us from locally as well as from far off places like Germany and so be sure and meet all of our visitors so that we can welcome you and if you have the opportunity to be in our area and worship with us again, we look forward to getting to know you better and encouraging you at that time uh, as well. If you have your Bibles, uh, keep your Bibles open there where Josh was reading in John 15. We'll look at a couple of other passages this morning as well and look at this particular context. But, you know, they say that fact is stranger than fiction. So I thought I would share a couple of things with you. Somebody sent me an email recently and there were about 30 different trivial facts and, and I thought a couple of them were worth repeating. Number one, did you know that a rat can last longer than a camel without water? Not that you need to know that. Did you know that when a bat exits a cave, it always turns left? thought that was interesting. At least you know which side to put the net on if you're going to try to catch a bat. Did you know that if you want to not cry while you're cutting an onion, chew gum and it'll keep you from crying? Did you know that there's one food you can eat and you actually it's negative calories? It's called celery. It takes more calories to eat a piece of celery than it does that the celery actually gives you. And then, do you know what book holds the record for being stolen the most number of times from public libraries? Yes, it's the Guinness Book of World Records. All right. Those things may not help you, but at least I have your attention, at least for right now. All right. In John chapter 15, Jesus is in the upper room. And Jesus has had the, the meal, the Passover meal with the disciples, the Last Supper. He instituted the Lord's Supper, the unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine to remember him. He said, after he had given thanks, this is my body, speaking of the bread. And then he said, this is my blood, the, the new co covenant, you know, which is given for many for the remission of sins. So Jesus has instituted that. He washes the disciples' feet. He looks into their faces as he begins to tell them about what is going to happen when they go to Jerusalem or during this time soon to come. And Jesus is there as he knows that his death is impending, as he knows he is going to be departing, and he sees the sorrow in their face. And even by foretelling his death, his departure, he cannot keep them from the disappointment. The, the hurt and the way that they feel is something that is heavy on their hearts. And so he speaks to them of his love at the end of John 13. He gives them a promise. He says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. 
Jesus promises there in the second half of chapter 14, the comforter. The, the comforter, the helper, the spirit of truth. He says he's going to come and he'll bring to you your remembrance all the things that I've said. Just imagine if you were a disciple of Jesus. How many notebooks could you have filled taking notes as Jesus spoke? And they didn't have those kind of stenography uh, uh, notebooks back then. They didn't have the little three-ring binders or anything. They had to remember the Spirit to bring to your remembrance, and He'll show you things to come. And when you are carried before kings and people in authority, He says, don't worry about what you're going to say, because the Spirit will give you. He makes these promises to the apostles. Jesus' closest disciples who are going to be with taking this message into all the world. And then in John 15, Jesus gave them this extended parable. It's a, an extended metaphor. I am the vine and you are the branches. And the picture that Jesus gives, people wonder why did he come up with this? Well, that image of God bringing a plant out of Egypt in Psalm 80 and verse 8 and planting it new. And then in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 7, the, the vineyard, the fact that God has planted this vineyard and he expects some sweet grapes. And then he says, but rather, he says, I expected justice, but you've given oppression. So there in Isaiah 5 and verse 7, it sounds like that Israel had become sour grapes. And then we've got the passage in Jeremiah 2 and verse 21. And there as the prophet Jeremiah speaks about God... And his love for Israel in Jeremiah 2 and verse 21. Listen to how he describes there. He says, yet I had planted you a noble vine, a seed of highest quality. How then have you turned before me into the degenerate plant of an alien vine? You see the, the brokenness of God, the, the hurt that God felt. He said, you had so much promise. So much potential. I gave you all the promises. And yet, you've turned in the other direction. You've gone against me. You're no longer connected. You're no longer feeding off of me. And so, look what's happened. Some people suggest that maybe because Jesus is about to die and he's been in the temple, that... One of the things that was there on the door of the temple was a very decorative vine that had been crafted on the door of the temple. So it's something that he would have seen that day. It's something that would have been on the mind of the disciples. Maybe it was the Lord's Supper itself. That using the image of the fruit of the vine to picture his blood. Whatever it is, Jesus gives them this, and he talks about this true vine, and it's not Israel. It's the true vine is those who are in a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It's being in Christ that means you're the true vine. It's being in Christ that makes you the true Israel, the true people of God. So we see Jesus explain this here in John 15, and I want you to look with me at how the branches are fruitful. First, look at verse 3. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. It's in that word, over and over in the New Testament, we see the word. It's by the washing of the water with the word, Ephesians 5.26, speaking of the relationship of Christ and his church compared to a husband and his wife. He talks in James 1.21, laying aside all filthiness and the overflow of wickedness, receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. The word is the sword of the Spirit in Ephesians 6, 17. It's that word that has brought us to the point that we can receive the cleansing power of Jesus and His blood. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The seed is the word of God, Luke 8, 11. The word of God is critical to our having this and entering into this relationship. And so it is the picture of baptism that when we have been baptized into Christ, we have put on Christ. Notice that Galatians 3.27, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ. What is Jesus talking about, the vine and the branches? Relationship. In Christ. Every spirit is found in Christ. 
And so we have to start out by being clean. Jesus, when he was washing the disciples' feet, he uses this same word that he uses in John 15, 3. He uses it there in John 13, 10. Because you remember when he was washing the feet, he came to Peter. What did Peter say? No, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. I'm not worthy. And Jesus says, he who does not allow me to wash his feet is not clean. And, Jesus, and then Peter changes his tune and he says, well, don't just wash my feet. Wash me all over. And Jesus says, you've already been cleansed, clean by the word. Understand the relationship here that what Jesus is saying is the vine starts out by being clean. It starts out by being fresh. It starts out by being pure. The word that he uses for clean is the word that we get the word catharsis. Don't you need a cleansing once in a while? Sometimes when people have things bottled up and pent up, They'll talk about crying as being an emotional catharsis. But the greatest cleansing that we can have is by the blood of Jesus. The greatest removal of guilt, the greatest opportunity to be able to see ourselves in the image of God is when we have been made clean. So many times, people's lives have to be changed. and They need that cleansing. A number of years ago, Steve Bartkowski was a, a famous quarterback with the Atlanta Falcons. He lived the life as a playboy. It was wild. Uh, It was by pleasure. It was selfish. It was indulgent. Steve Barkowski hurt his knee and was going through the rehab and everything and wasn't sure if his career was going to continue. And, And in that point, in a low point, he realized he couldn't do it himself. He realized he needed help, and he became a Christian. And the change in his life, though it wasn't immediate and completely all at once, It was something that gradually led him to become a much more gentle, a much more humble, a much more selfless person. And he described that to a friend as talking about a new mindset, a new personality, a new person because of Jesus Christ. Notice what Jesus says about this in verse 2. He talks about the cultivating. There's the cleansing that we have when we enter into Christ and we become in this relationship, we enter into this union with Christ. But then there's the cultivating. And there's two parts of this. He says that the one, the the part, the branch that doesn't bear fruit, he said he takes away. And that means to cut away, to lift up, and to remove. It's the same word in John 11, 39, when Jesus came to the tomb where his friend, his dear friend Lazarus had been laid, and he tells them there in John 11, 39, to lift up and to take away the stone. Roll that stone away. What we see is that God, as the husbandman, God as the vine dresser, and the word for this husbandman means to work the earth, to labor in the earth. It's a word that we get a name from. You ever known anybody named George? You ever said the phrase, by George? Or let George do it? The idea of a vine dresser, God is one who works in the soil of your heart. And it is that God would remove someone who was not in that right relationship, if someone has gone into sin and they turn away from Jesus Christ, they can be removed. It is possible to lose one's salvation. And this parable of the vine and the branches shows it clearly. But then there's the other type of cutting, the cultivation that happens because of the pruning. And that cultivation happens because of our prayer. It happens because of Bible study as we look into the mirror of the Word. It happens to us because of the discipline of life. The providence of God. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 to 11, the Hebrew writer talks about this, this one. He says, now no chastening is joyful in the present. It's painful, but it's necessary for righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Has your life been trained by the difficulties that you've had? There are things that happen to us and we say, I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. The fact is it's necessary for the cultivation. In vineyards, the ones who take care of those vineyards realize that there are certain shoots or certain branches that are never going to produce. They take a lot of leaves, they take a lot of, they sap a lot of life. They have to be cut. Judas had left the room, he had walked away. The training that was taking place was drastic. Recently in the news, there were two ladies 
that found two kittens. They wanted to be good Samaritans, so they took these kittens home to feed them and nurture them. But the kittens started biting them and became very aggressive. So they called somebody from an animal shelter to come and look at these kittens. It turns out that they were wild bobcat kittens. They were not going to be domesticated. They had to be taken away and put in a wildlife refuge. But understand, as God cultivates, as God disciplines, it's to change our character. It's to help us to become what Jesus also talks about here, more Christ-like. Look at verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. There is a change that is meant in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. As Paul talks about this change that is ongoing in our lives, he says, but we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Now he said right before this in verse 17, now the Lord is the Spirit and the Spirit, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. This transformation comes with liberty. It is freeing. We experience the freedom of God as we want more and more what God wants. That Christ-likeness, that being transformed into the image of Jesus Christ, that process helps us to be able to see the fullness. When you're starting a car, I remember back when I was my first vehicle, an old 1961 Chevy pickup. If it didn't start, you could take a, a screwdriver, put it there on the spark plug, and sometimes you could get it to, to start. But I will tell you this, if you didn't have a rubber grip on the, on the screwdriver, you got a shock too. It didn't feel good. But the car, the automobile had to have gas and a spark. Gas and a spark. It took both for it to be able to run. And here what Jesus says, abide in me and I in you. There's two things here that, Paul, that, that Jesus is talking about that Paul develops later in Galatians chapter 5 to walk in the Spirit. And that is, we've got to be dependent. Jesus says there in verse 5, without me or apart from me, you can do nothing. I am dependent upon him, his guiding, his leading, his direction then there's also the discipline. And I've got to study the Bible. I've got to get into the Word of God. I've got to pray. I've got to be able to try to live my life. I've got to worship with my brothers and sisters, enjoy fellowship because we sharpen each other as iron sharpens iron. And I've got to be doing acts of service. There are things that my life is going to lead. There are things that I'm going to be doing. Why? Because Jesus is in me and I am in Him. Dependence, discipline. Without dependence, my discipline is barren. And without discipline, my dependence is barren. It takes both. To become more Christ-like, to let Him work in my life, cleanse me and, and cultivate me, and reach toward that conforming into the image of Christ. Dependence, discipline. Am I letting both work? Am I dependent upon God's direction? Am I disciplining myself to let that image of Christ be formed in me? It enlivens us. It refreshes us. It emboldens us. You say, well, I don't have courage. I'm really kind of shy to talk about Jesus. Not if you're becoming more Christ-like. Not if you're letting him have his way in your life. The more that I become like Christ, guess what? I I'm not bashful. I'm bold. Because I realize where the power is and I know why I've been changing. I know how God is bringing me. And so he gives us four evidences here of this fruit. If I'm going to live a fruitful life, look at what he says in verse 7. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. I'm going to have answered prayer. But understand that sometimes people read these verses like this and in other places in John 14... If I ask anything in his name, he'll do it. You ask over in 1 John 5, 14 and 15, and, and it sounds like you just got this, this, this empty bag going through a candy store. No. When he says, if you ask anything in my name. 
according to my will. It means that what I want more than anything, my life is being formed in the image of Christ. You know what Christ did when he left heaven? The will of the Father. You know what he was seeking to accomplish while he was here on earth? The glory of the Father. When I prayed, you know what I want? I want the will of God. I want to be able to live my life to the glory of God. And my prayers are more and more fashioned toward God having His way in my life. Not like, well, God, what can I ask for today? That million dollars, I still haven't gotten that from last week, but I'll go ahead and ask for the second million. Folks, that's not what prayer is. That's not what prayer is about. And I'm not saying you can't ask for your needs for those things that, that, that are genuine in your life. But what I'm telling you is, if you want the will of God, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. They'll all happen if I'm lining my life with the will of God. Answered prayer. There are tests that if I'm, being, if I'm living my life according to His will, if I'm depending upon Him and I'm disciplining my life, look at verse 8. Second evidence of a fruitful life is bearing fruit. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. The fruit in the New Testament, there's fruit. Paul wanted fruit to go to Rome, to have more disciples made, to be able to bear fruit as far as converting people to Christ through the gospel. There's also fruit like Paul talks about in Galatians 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. There are nine qualities there, nine characteristics, but notice one fruit. The fruit. I know we like to say the fruits. And there are other passages that talk about fruits. I'm not saying you can't use the plural, but I'm telling you that when Paul talks about the fruit of the Spirit, there is one, one characteristic and that is, it comes from God. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are working to produce fruit in your life. And we ought to be bearing fruit. So the fruit, look at the evidence of this. As Jesus talks here, the bearing of this fruit. Look with me. Turn back at the end of chapter 14. Look at verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus, some of your disciples are going to be thrown in jail. Jesus, some of your disciples are going to be martyred. They're going to be put to death. How can you say, my peace I give to you? Because Jesus' peace is not just about the here and now. Jesus' peace is about the hereafter. Jesus is looking at the long run. Where will you spend eternity? Jesus is looking at that peace of having peace with God. And then the things that happen between people are not near as significant. When I got first things first, I can have that peace. And so Jesus would say over in chapter 16, verse 33, These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. Our peace. Bearing fruit? Can you have peace? Because you're at peace with God. He talks about his joy. Look at verse 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. Folks, Jesus' joy is not just some momentary enthusiasm, just a, a, an emotional high. You know what Jesus' joy is? The joy that says, I know where I'm going to spend eternity. I, I may have gotten up this morning and, and I may have had some aches and pains and I may not be feeling as good as I did maybe last week last year I got some things going on in my life that are kind of keeping things turned up but you know what my joy is in Jesus Christ and no one can take that from me the joy of the Lord is my strength this Wednesday night we'll talk about from Psalm 51 restoring the joy of my salvation Jesus says my joy may remain in you if we remain in Christ and Christ's words will remain in us guess what we're going to have joy it's going to be as natural as day and night. Understand. And then he says, love. Look at verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. See, the peace and the joy and the love of Christ is not just the peace and the joy and love of the world. It's not just like a roller coaster where it's up and it's down. What we have in Christ, 
If I abide in Christ, and Christ abides in me, I have this joy, this peace, this love. I have it constantly in Him. So Jesus talks about this love, that we ought to love one another. He goes on in verses 12 to 17 to say, Greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for his friends. And he goes, You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. See, what Jesus tells us to do is for our benefit and for our love. And so there is this joy in verse 11. And that joy, do you remember how Jesus' joy worked? The Hebrew writer would say, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus saw the cross as joy. You say, how could he do that? The pain that he was going to endure. How awful it was what Jesus did to die on the cross. But Jesus saw joy because he was thinking about you. He was thinking about me. And what Jesus was saying is, I'm doing this for you. You can bear fruit for me. Abide in me. My words in you. If you are my disciples, you'll bear much fruit. And Jesus says all of this because there is power. And what Jesus has done for us. In February of 1941, in Auschwitz, Poland, Maximilian Kolbe was placed there in the concentration camp. He had been helping Polish Jews escape from Nazi terror after Maximilian Kolbe had been there for a few months. There was an escape. And what the Nazis did, their way of dealing with an attempted escape was to punish. They would take ten prisoners call their names from the roll, place them in a box, in a cell, and not feed them. They would die, and everyone else could see it, they would die of starvation. It was a horrible thing. On this one occasion, one of the Polish Jews, Frandyshek Gasabnacek, I'll probably only say that once, Frandyshek Gasabnacek, was called... And the man looked and he was crying and he said, I've got a wife and children. I don't want to leave them. And Maximilian Colby stepped forward and he said, I'll take his place. And Maximilian Colby was placed in that cell. And he lasted until August of 1941 where he finally succumbed to starvation and he died. A couple of decades ago, NBC News caught up with Maximilian Colby who was then 82 years old. And in his little house, he took them out into his yard, and there he had a monument with the name Maximilian Colby on it. And he had written on there, he died in my place. And with tears, as Gasabnicek was telling the story, he said, every day I live with the fact that I live because someone died for me. Someone died for me. I know that when Mike was talking this morning about the joy of remembering the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he said we should rejoice. And yes, we can rejoice because we live because someone died for me. Today, are you living a fruitful life? Because Jesus took your place so that you could have life and you could have it more abundant. If you today realize that the first thing you need to do is come into that union with Christ, you need to say, I, I can't, he's the vine. And I can't be one of the branches unless I come into Christ. And you want to obey the gospel by being baptized today, we would love to assist you to do that. If you are a child of God and you realize, you say, well, I, I need that discipline. I need to be cultivated so that I can become more Christ-like. And I've got some things I need to confess and get it off my chest. I need the cleansing that can come from making that good confession today. Make that confession. If we can assist you in any way, the Lord invites you. The fruitful life awaits you. Won't you come right now while we stand and while we sing?